Um, my poor mother trying to tell people what I do, she just says, she's just a nurse. So anyway, so let's take a look at how it started. Um, the history was in the late 1980s. Dr. Freeman, who was president of the American Cancer Society at the time, uh, he identified different barriers of groups of people why they weren't getting the health care that they need. Um, and he was an oncologist, uh, surgeon. Uh, groups of concerns that he was looking at specifically were minorities, the poor, and the uninsured. And it's similar, this is 19, late 1980s, and it's the same group of people that we're, <coughs> we're dealing with now. So. Um, and then, so he put together a hearing, which he actually involved the cancer patients. It wasn't the physicians, it wasn't the social workers. He asked the cancer patients, what's preventing you from getting the prevention and the treatment that you need? So what they found out, he put in a report to the Nation on Cancer of the Poor in 1989. The critical findings was that economically disadvantaged, they faced significant barriers to care, especially when it came to the treatment of cancer. And we'll go over the barriers here in a minute. Um, they also made great sacrifices to obtain cancer, the cancer care or chose not to, to even see cancer because of their inability to pay. Everybody knows cancer is very, very expensive. Um, and so a lot of them, if they're having a hard time paying their bills or a hard time, you know, with car payments or gas payments or anything like that, and to see that you may have a chemotherapy copay come up, they may not even choose to seek care. Um, they also, those who were poor, experienced greater pain and suffering and death. And it wasn't because they have a low co uh, tolerance for pain, it's that usually by the time that they were sick enough to go to an ER or to seek treatment, they were already in the late stages of the disease and often it was incurable at the time. Late stage cancer is, can be very painful, it can be, uh, cause a lot of suffering, especially if it's not treated early. So. And then they also, fatalism was uh, prevalent among this, this population. Fatalism, fatalism in, I have cancer, I'm probably going to die anyway. I won't put my family through the stress of it. I won't put them through the financial trouble. So I just won't go seek care. So with these findings, nurse navigation was born. Uh, in 1990, uh, they started the, Har the first navigation uh, program in the Harlem Hospital Center in New York City. It was breast cancer only, it was the first group, and it was paid for by a grant from the American Cancer Society. Well, guess what? Dr. Friedman was the president of the American Cancer Society. So that's how it started. They did two studies. One was before the navigation pro uh, program started. They went back and looked at 606 patients from 1964 to 86. They were all of a low economic status and half did not have any medical coverage whatsoever. And as you can see, only 6% had stage one at the time di diagnosis. Stage one is very early stage, um, mostly treatable, often curable. After the na navigation program, the Journal of American College of Surgeons went back and looked at, at the different cancer patients again, treated at the Harlem <coughs> Cancer Center under the navigation program. Now nearly, the key here is nearly half had no medical insurance on initial evaluation. The key here is that the navigator either found them insurance, found them resources, found them financial assistance. So that, that will uh, change their, their thinking. So and then staging improvements, now they have 41 at stage zero. Stage zero usually doesn't require um, chemo or radiation. And then stage one. So they went from 6% to 41%. And five-year survival rate went from 39% to 70. So they almost doubled with the use of nurse navigating. And this is back in the 90s. The assessment of the program, not rocket science. Patients who work with the navigator got care faster and more efficiently than those who did not. Why the dramatic control improvements? Well, they offer uh, free and low-cost screening mammograms. Remember, it was just a breast cancer, so they had their own detection. So that's why they had the increase in, in zero and one stage. It promoted early treatment without delaying. Without delay means that um, the patients, often they would come when they're stage two and three, or they would be diagnosed and then not seek it, uh, treatment after that. And so the navigator would, would carry them through that system, <coughs> give them the surgeon, the radiation, the, the medical oncologist, whatever they needed. And then public ed education and community outreach. They went out to the community, told them about the program that they had, told them about the low cost or free mammograms, and really increased their program there. So the role of the nurse navigator, who is a nurse navigator? Again, I told you it could be an educator, it could be a social worker, it could be a nurse, um, it could be an LVN, an RN, it could be a medical assistant who's been specially trained. Um, anybody that's interested in navigating, you just have to have 
a true compassion for people because you really are their advocate the whole time through their journey. And it doesn't necessarily have to be cancer. It can be any chronic disease. It can be diabetes. It can be heart disease. Um, anything that would require multiple appointments, um, extravagant treatments. Um, what is it? We're advocates. That's what we are. Um, we're just there for the patient to do whatever they need um, and where. They can be in a hospital. There's a, a big program over at North Central Baptist for their health program. We have a nurse navigator. And I know she's currently navigating over 150 patients. So it's a growing program. Um, the one thing about that program is that she works with a set group of physicians. So she has a set group of surgeons, set group of radiation oncologists, and a set group of medical oncologists. So the patients are navigated within that system. And then, like, I'm actually at CTRC, and, but I work um, with patients throughout the state. So I have an office there. Um, if they want a second opinion, I can go right next to the clinic next door, and the doctors are there. Um, but it can actually be even in a, a private physician's uh, group also. When, you can get them pre-diagnosis. You can get them at the prevention stage. You can get them right at the beginning, um, middle right when they're getting chemo, and I'm actually working with family members now who contacted me after their, the family member had passed away. So I'm actually helping them after death. Um, never met the patient, the patient had expired before they ever contacted me. So I'm helping them with um, multiple, multiple forms and you know, health insurance, life insurance is being paid out, and that can just be completely overwhelming. So. And how, it's just resources. I brought a bunch of them, we'll go through. Um, Resource, that's what you'll hear. Resources, resources, resources. Um, it just becomes overwhelming sometimes they just don't know where to even start. And so the how is that you're there to help them. And questions and answers, as you see, it goes both ways. They have questions, I try to answer. If I don't have the answer, I go back with a question to somebody that might. I work very strongly with, the, uh, with our social worker because there's things that I just don't even know where to start. And she has all the community resources. So um, it's a big group effort. So you have cancer. As Anybody in here, uh, I don't.